Houdini's daring and innovative performances made him a cultural icon and a pioneer in the world of magic and entertainment. A renowned Hungarian-American illusionist and stunt performer in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, his stunts were dramatic and eye-catching, designed to draw crowds and media attention. He was best known for his incredible escape acts, where he would get out from handcuffs, straitjackets and other restraints, often while submerged in water or suspended in the air. His daring feats also included such stunts as breaking out of jail cells and iron boxes, allowing himself to be buried alive and perhaps his most famous stunt was the Chinese water torture cell, where he was suspended upside down in a water-filled tank with his feet shackled, which for years many people mistakenly believed was how he died. In the autumn of 1926, 52-year-old Harry Houdini, the great escape artist, began what would end up being his final tour, as he would suddenly and unexpectedly pass away, only weeks later. Spanning the decades, there would be speculation and assumption about the real cause of his demise. But what or who really did kill Houdini? To determine this we need to step back to the beginning of the fateful tour. It began on a sour note at the onset, as his beloved wife Bess, who was also his stage assistant, was suddenly struck with food poisoning. Yet as a master illusionist Houdini knew how to turn adversity into spectacle and he pressed on. But this tour was different, the absence of her vibrant spirit was a blow to Houdini. Then, as if fate were playing a cruel trick, during a particularly challenging stunt he suffered a broken ankle. The pain, as excruciating as it was, could not break his resolve. Houdini was no stranger to physical pain, his death-defying acts often meant pushing his body to its absolute limits. Yet, a broken ankle was a severe hindrance for a man whose livelihood depended on his physical prowess. The show must go on, and so Houdini, ever the professional, continued to perform. His resilience in the face of adversity was a testament to his character, a trait that endeared him to audiences worldwide. This was the man who had captured the world's imagination, the man who had made the impossible seem possible. This was Harry Houdini, and his final tour was just beginning. On a fateful morning on Friday, October 22nd in his dressing room at the Princess Theatre in Montreal, Canada, Houdini's tour took a distressing turn. The great escape artist had a visitor, a McGill student named J. Gordon Whitehead. This young man, driven by a desire to test Houdini's famed resilience, delivered a severe blow to the magician's abdomen. The unsuspecting Houdini, already nursing a broken ankle, had little time to brace himself for the impact. This event, a seemingly innocent test of strength, would later fuel a persistent narrative. Many would come to believe that Houdini, the man who escaped from chains and locks, succumbed to a punch to the stomach. The story was simple, dramatic and tragically ironic. The escape artist unable to escape a fatal blow, yet the truth was far more complex than this tale suggests. Following the incident, Houdini appeared to shrug off the blow, continuing with his performances as though nothing had happened. He was a showman through and through, committed to his craft despite the pain. But the following day, he found himself unable to shrug off his deteriorating condition. Despite his pain, Houdini boarded a night train to Detroit for his next performance. Little did he know his condition was far more serious than he could have ever imagined. The punch from Whitehead became a part of Houdini's story, a dramatic twist in the final act of his life. But the idea that this blow was the cause of his death was largely speculation. It created a compelling narrative, but it disregarded the complexities of Houdini's physical condition and the events that followed. A week after the incident, Houdini met his untimely demise. His death shocked the world, leaving behind a legacy of mystery and intrigue. But the question remained, what really killed the great Harry Houdini? The day after the unexpected blow from J. Gordon Whitehead, Houdini was ailing, and his condition was deteriorating with each passing hour. Yet, his unbreakable spirit was unwavering. He continued to perform, his body cloaked in pain, his mind focused on the thrill of the act. His performance on Saturday evening was nothing short of extraordinary. Despite the excruciating pain radiating from his abdomen, he thrilled the audience with his daring feats. Once the curtain fell however the magician could barely manage to change into his street clothes. His body was screaming for rest, for medical attention, yet, instead of going to the hospital, he went back to his hotel. The next morning, his fever had reached a worrisome 102 degrees by the time he reached the theater. The Detroit doctor who examined Harry in his dressing room in the Garrick Theater on Sunday afternoon, determined that acute appendicitis was most likely to blame. The doctor advised immediate hospitalization, but Houdini, ever the performer, insisted on performing his sold-out show. 
he somehow managed to complete his act, barely standing, and then once again, rejected hospital care and returned to his hotel. The resident physician at the hotel, alarmed by Houdini's deteriorating condition, summoned the hospital's chief surgeon. The surgeon arrived in the middle of the night, at 3 in the morning, and urgently recommended hospital admission. But Houdini, ever the skeptic, sought a second opinion from his New York doctor. It wasn't until the following afternoon that Houdini finally submitted to surgery. By then, it was evident that his appendix had ruptured, releasing infectious pus into his abdominal cavity. A condition known as peritonitis, which, in an era before antibiotics, was a death sentence. Houdini's condition worsened, but he refused to cancel his shows. His determination to perform, to thrill, to escape, was as strong as ever. But his body, it seems, could not escape the clutches of his illness. The great Houdini, the master of escape, was finally facing a trap he couldn't get out of. Despite the odds, Houdini battled on. He held on to life with the same grit and determination that had defined his extraordinary career. Houdini fought valiantly for six more days, ultimately succumbing to his illness on Sunday, October 31, 1926. The debate surrounding the cause of Houdini's death is significant because at the time of his passing, he was deeply engaged in a crusade against spiritualism. He spent a considerable portion of his time debunking the belief that the living could communicate with the deceased and exposing fraudulent spirit mediums. Enraged spiritualists had foreseen his death and, with Houdini's passing on Halloween, they swiftly claimed responsibility for his demise. Conspiracy theories emerged, suggesting Whitehead was an agent of the spiritualists, while others believed that a vengeful spirit guided Whitehead's hand in the Princess Theater dressing room. Harry Houdini was a man of intense competitiveness, driven by an unyielding desire to always win. He would have despised the notion of spiritualists gloating over his death, as he had cautioned that they might. Despite speculation, J. Gordon Whitehead's punch did not trigger Houdini's appendicitis. This is the conclusion drawn from a detailed surgical review of Houdini's case. The concept of traumatic appendicitis, the idea that a blow to the abdomen could lead to this condition, has been deemed shaky at best. The review affirmed that no causal link has been established between trauma and appendicitis, dispelling any lingering belief that Whitehead's punch sparked Houdini's fatal affliction. Appendicitis is primarily driven by bacterial infection, not by abdominal blows. Houdini's timeline further bolsters this conclusion. Even the great Houdini could not have endured nine days with a ruptured appendix. His symptoms were already present before Whitehead's punch and rapidly worsened afterwards, suggesting an infection that had already taken hold. The timeline unequivocally rules out Whitehead's punch as the cause of Houdini's death. And so, the real killer of Houdini was not a student's fist, but a common yet deadly, bacterial infection. Or was the killer in fact, Harry Houdini himself, who refused to seek proper medical attention before it was too late?